everyone, it is 9.30 and history is calling. So the question is, where will history take you? And today is the very first of our series on, uh, on history. And, and our, our, uh, our first uh, presenter is, uh, well, we're, we're, we're just really happy to be here to, to announce the start of our, of our series, Ira Pemp. Hemstein is the uh, advisory archivist at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Line, li, uh, Library. Uh, Ira will speak to us about how he secured his role, what students can do to be qualified for similar roles, and uh, he's going to kind of dive into the passion of his work. It's been fun for me to, to uh, talk to Ira and to get to know him. He is a really great guy. Uh, Ira is in charge of the staff who are responsible for, for preserving and reviewing and cataloging over 65 million pages of documents that cover Ronald Reagan's pre president. Um, not only his presidency, but, but his time in California and his career in Hollywood. And, and, uh, and I guess even after he was president. So you pretty well chronicled his, in, his entire life. Uh, in, in addition, uh, the archival staff that, uh, that I leads preserve and review over two and a half million photographs, audio cassettes, and film reels. And so with that, I'm gonna turn the time uh, over to Ira. And uh, Ira, if you can just kind of give us a little bit, I have some questions to ask you. And, and folks, if you have questions, uh, we'd like to, to, to private chat to L Lindsay Blau. And then towards the end of our, of our meeting today, we will uh, ask you to help participate and to ask these questions and so we'll call on you. So um, with that in mind, Ira, how did you get to where you are? What's your, what's your story? That's my story? Well, first of all, I want to say good morning to everybody. Uh, hello, BYU. This is an uh, absolute honor for me uh, to do this uh, and be your first uh, uh, speaker. And this is, uh, uh, I, I, I enjoy doing this very much. So um, thank you, Arnie, for inviting me. Um, my story. Um, I started college, uh, it was in the 1980s, and um, back then I, I wasn't sure really what I wanted to do, or really what I wanted to, to be. Uh, um, I, I felt back then you went to college, you got a degree, you, you know, you finished, you got a good job, you started a family the, and so forth and, and, and so on. And back then, the, the social sciences, humanities, things like that didn't really, weren't really practical unless you wanted to be a, a, a teacher. So, um, I dabbled in business, accounting, finance, and, you know, it just, nothing, nothing for me stuck. Nothing I, w I could be, I was ever passionate about. Uh, I remember feeling very, very uh, lost. To the point where I felt, I said, you know, this really isn't working for me. I'm going to take a year and um, work, reassess, and then come back. That was my plan. Okay. Nine years later, um, I was. I was married, uh, had a mortgage and all those wonderful things. I had um, started, a, I had a fairly successful career in information technology. I was a network administrator for a large company. But I was always that I hadn't, I hadn't finished my degree. So on my third, I remember on my thirtieth birthday, um, I had a long talk with my wife, and I said, "I just, I, I, I need to do this." I, my father had passed away a few years prior, 
and I felt bad that he didn't see me, you know, finish. And I said, you know, for him and for me, I just, I just, and at that time, I just wanted to finish. It didn't really even matter at that time. It didn't even, to me, it didn't even really matter in what. I just wanted to finish my degree. So at 30, I went back to um, school. And the, one of the first classes I had signed up for was a class on uh, early 20th century uh, European history. And I don't know what it was, but day one in the class, um, everything I have been looking for happened. I, the, 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 the interest and the passion and the excitement I felt, and you know, it's, it's interesting, I'm not too sure, you know, obviously I had taken history classes before in high school in general and in, in, in when I first started going to school. And so I'm, I'm not sure if I was, was older or was the professor, but I, almost instantaneously, I felt, I finally felt this, this was it. And you know what, I'm, I'm so glad that, that you called it, this program History is Calling because that's, that's really what it is. You know, we, we all have to find our, what our calling is. And at age 30, I finally felt I found what mine was. Um, so the issue then became, okay, it's great. This is, this, is, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to be. What am I going to do with this? Um, I felt I didn't really um, want to be a, a, a teacher. Um, at the time, I felt I, uh, being 30 years old, I didn't really want to dedicate myself for the time to a, to a PhD program and end up, you know, again, I had responsibilities here in Los Angeles, I had a family, um, but I felt there had to be something that I can do with this degree, that I could still do practice the field that I, I now discovered that I, that I love. And so I began researching, talking to faculty and whatnot. And, and, and one of the faculty led me into the area, well, have you ever considered public history? And that, but what's public history? Well, you know, things like you know, museums, libraries, things, things along, along those lines. And um, I was like, well, you know, I really, I honestly never really thought about that before. So I began uh, doing research and uh, initially I found that, that I thought, well, this, this is actually going to be, work out quite well because there have been a lot of advances in information technology in libraries. And I thought, well, my, my previous work experience with my education experience would be a, a great combination. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna, I will focus on, on that. Um, so I started looking for graduate programs in, in library science. And I found, um, I met a gentleman, his name was Robert Marshall, who was the head archivist at uh, California State University in Northridge. And I remember I gave him a call and he um, told me a little about the program. And then he told me, he said, well, it's not really a, quite a public history program, it's more of an archival sciences program. And again, I was like, well, well can you, you know, what did I, at that time, what did I know about art? Archives were, you know, damp, moldy basements that, you know, didn't get a lot of sun. You know, I had never really been to one before. So he told me, he said, well, I, well come to campus. I'll, I'll show you around. I'll sh you know, we'll talk more about the program. And um, I was, uh, great. So I, he, he had set aside about an hour for me, I'll tell you. That day, that you said an hour for me, it turned out to be about five hours that day. Um, he took me down into the archival stacks and he showed me all the various collections and to see all these 
original documents, all these primary source materials dating back to the uh, 19th century was just so fascinating to me. And he started talking to me about, about what actual archival science was and how to you know, arrangements and preservation techniques and cataloging techniques. And it was almost like that initial excitement I felt again when I, when I first came back to school and took my first history course. And he said, this, you know, so you, the program is 50% archives, 50% history, you get to do both. And uh, I was wonderful, wonderful. Yes, so uh-huh. I started, I started graduate school there and um, have started working on campus in the archives there. Um, I was very fortunate to be able to uh, land an uh, internship at the uh, J. Paul Getty Museum here in Los Angeles to work in their archives. And um, and then I, I graduated with a master's, you know, MA in history with a U.S. history and, and archival science uh, specializations. And so I graduated from graduate school, and there was absolutely nothing happened. <laughs> I had no job, no project, no anything. Um, I have a um, a wonderful, wonderful wife who was so great during that time because, as, you know, as everyone can imagine, uh, you know, when I had turned thirty, I came to her and said, "You know, sweetheart, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to give up everything, <laughs> go back to school, and start over again." And she had been so great supporting me through this whole time, but you know. I, when I remember when I finished uh, school and there really at that time there was no prospects, um, the, I mean, you know, patients were starting to <laughs> get a little um, uh, thin for all of us. And after about six months, um, I was told that the um, Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, which was only maybe five, 10 miles from where I lived, I had never been, um, was hiring for I uh, had a couple entry level positions. Um, so I studied up on presidential libraries and, and, and whatnot and um, applied and was very fortunate to have been uh, selected uh, for what was called an archives technician, which is a very low level entry position um, at the Reagan Library. And um, and so I began, began my career at the Reagan Library. And after a couple of years, um, I noticed there was no, um, unfortunately there wasn't a lot of promotion potential. Um, most of the staff who was working there at the time was the original staff from 1991 when the when the library opened. So to, to move up from a, an assistant archivist to a full archivist um, just was not, the, unfortunately there was a lot of, a lot of openings at that time. Um, so I received a call from a colleague at the uh, Richard Dixon Presidential Library, which is about 50 miles south in, in Orange County, um, and said that they were, they needed some, you know, full level archivists. Um, in your Belinda, where the next library is. Uh, tough decision, loved being at Reagan, but I felt for career, it was necessary. So I um, uh, accepted the position and um, moved from uh, Reagan to Nixon. And I was there uh, in your Belinda at the Nixon Library for seven years. And I'll tell you, at, that, at that point, I was very content. I was very, I felt very happy. I was very fortunate. And I said, if this is as far as my career takes me, that's fine. You know, any, any other kind of higher level would have required probably to move to Washington, DC. And again, I, you know, wasn't going to do that. So, um, I, I was, I was fine. Um, 
until one day in uh, uh, 2014, I got a call from uh, from the director at the Reagan Library who told me um, the uh, the head archivist, a gentleman named Michael Dugan, who, who was actually the person who hired me back in the early days, uh, was uh, retiring and they needed a new head archivist and he asked if I would consider doing it, uh, throw my hat in the ring. And that again was just a tremendous honor. And um, I, I said, absolutely. And um, it was very, very uh, hard competition. A lot of very, very smart people uh, applied for the job, but um, luckily I, I, I was selected. Um, and um, yeah, left Yorba Linda with a lot of great people who I, I admired and came back to uh, Simi Valley to run the archives at um, the Reagan Library. And, you know, I, I will never forget my first day back at Reagan and, you know, I that nice new office and, and you know, name on the door and everything like that. And I remember I sat back in my chair and I thought, what a journey. <laughs> wow, what a journey this has been. Um, it had been five years. I was 35. Um, well, I was 35 when I finished school. I was uh, 42 when I became the, the head archivist. And I, it just was amazing to me how I went from just wanting to finish school to just such a major life changing uh, experience. And, and I've been the head archivist at Reagan now for um, eight years. And it's, it's the, we'll talk more about it, I'm sure, but it's, it's, it's the greatest job a person who loves history can have. That's, a, that's amazing. All right, tell, tell us, you know, what, what you're doing, why is what you're doing now so meaningful for history or even personally? I mean, you're, you're there at the, at the Reagan Library. What, why is that so meaningful for history? Well, I, you know, we're the, we're the caretakers of the, the, the primary sources that historians rely on to, to, to practice their craft. That's why it, to, to be um, a successful archivist, you also have to be a, a historian as well. You have to understand research methodologies, um, know your um, your particular area that where your uh, uh, your archives is. Um, we all on my staff, all of us have to stay up to date on all the, the historiography related to, to Ronald Reagan. And, um, you know, the, most of this material, you know, as you said in your introduction, we have, we have 65 million pages of documents. The library has been open to the public since 1991. 51% of that of that 65 million pages is open to the public for research. The rest has, has yet to be reviewed. I'll talk a little bit more about that process. So there's still, you know, 49% of 65 million pages of documents from the Reagan administration, Ronald Reagan's life, that has not been seen by anybody since they, these materials were originally created. And, you know, one of the, the, th the excitements about coming to work every day, um, when we could come to work every day, unfortunately, because of everything happening with the uh, COVID-19, none of us have been to the library in, in, in several months, is you don't know that on any given day what you're going to come across. You have no idea what you're going to find what documents um, 
are going to are going to say, you know, and um, you know, some some days are you're reviewing these materials. Some days nothing particularly exciting. It can be a little tedious at times, but you know, sometimes you find that one document and you know you're working with a researcher on a particular topic and you find oh my gosh this this is what they're looking for this is what they need you know this this will help for their thesis tremendously and it is such a such a exciting feeling to be able to find something again that hasn't been seen to the public and to make it available you know and uh, you know i remember the first time I was um, acknowledged in a book, you know, uh, the author, you know, did an acknowledgement thing, they say, you know, like to thank the archivist. And I, you know, I, I almost felt like uh, it was my book. I, I bought five copies. I gave one to my mother. Okay. <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> you know, look at me, I'm on page XXI. You know? <laughs> um, because it is a, it is a close, uh, it is a close relationship, you know. You, you're on this journey with the historians, pretty much from start to finish. Ira, can you can you tell us about maybe some exciting projects that you're involved with or have been involved with? I know there's some stuff that maybe you can't talk about, but but uh, <laughs> you know something that that was exciting or is exciting or something that's coming up in the future that that you're excited about. Well, um, I, I don't know. Everybody who's watching, if people how familiar people are with the uh, the uh, presidential library system, so I thought maybe I'd just kind of give a, an overview to everybody on 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 what that is and what, what exactly we do. Um, so I actually I actually work for the National Archives and Records Administration. I'm I'm a, I'm a federal employee, um, and NARA. Um, uh, a division of NARA is what's called the the Presidential Library System, and that began um, with President uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, the National Archives was a was a, a new agency started in the in the mid 1930s, and Roosevelt felt that he wanted one. There should be one central location. For the public and scholars to be able to come to to study um, an administration, a presidential administration, and the, and the era of that administration, so he actually donated um, a portion of his estate in High Park, New York, to be the first presidential library. And so, and what's, what's fascinating, I still find it fascinating to this day. Is in during that time, when 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 Roosevelt was president, presidential materials, created anything created during a president's administration, were considered that president's uh, personal property, and when they left office, they were it, it you know it was their it was their materials. So what Roosevelt ended up doing was, he he donated his presidential materials to the National Archives to review and care and take care of and, and preserve and catalog and make available um, um, to the public. So um, after his passing, uh, Pre President Truman, and when Truman finished his administration, he said, you know, the, I'm, this is, I'm going to do what uh, Roosevelt did. I'm going to start a library too. So he Developed as a library in, in Independence, Missouri, and um, that was when the, the first law. Um, there are three major laws that have been developed um, that have directly affect presidential libraries, and so the first law was the was called the Presidential Libraries Act of 1955, and pretty much that states that a, a president who wants to have a library. They don't have to. They all do, but they, there's no, there's no law saying that they have to have a library. So, if a president wants a library, they have to raise the funds themselves. 
to to build it. No government, no taxpayer money is involved in the in in the uh, construction of of the president's library. The president raises the funds themselves, and then once the library is finished, it is donated to the National Archives to um, to maintain and to, to run the facility and to maintain the materials. Um, again, the president's materials were the president's personal property. So when he donated his materials to the National Archives, he could place any restrictions on the materials that he wanted because it was his personal property. So there, a, what's called a deed of gift would be developed between NARA and the president and, and the library moved forward. And it just, every president after that, did. Eisenhower, Kennedy State, Johnson, they all followed suit. You know, administration came to an end, president raised the funds, built the library, usually in their, in their home states, uh, and then donated the materials to uh, the this all changed in the, during the Nixon administration because, as we know, President Nixon resigned from office, and he would uh, he had made a, an arrangement with the National Archives that he would he would donate his materials after he had a chance to kind of review everything himself. Well, the, you know, Watergate and everything was still going on. Congress. Um, did not um, feel comfortable with this. So Congress actually passed the second piece of major legislation called the, the Presidential Recordings and Materials Preservation Act. And it, it is the only law developed strictly for Richard Nixon and the Nixon materials. And so what ended up happening was Congress actually seized all of Nixon's presidential materials from him and took him back to Washington. Um, and the, there's lots of lawsuits back and forth on the materials. But that, you know, I can, you know there, there's questions about Nixon specifically, I'm happy to answer them. But the, the reason why I bring that up is that that fundamentally changed everything. Because Congress realized at that point in time, you know, presidents, maybe presidents having, considering you know, their materials, personal property is, maybe that's not the, that's not the best idea. So, um, 1978, uh, Congress passed what's known, what's known as the Presidential Records Act. Um, and the Presidential Records Act was going to begin with whoever was in office on January 20th, 1981, which turned out to be Ronald Wilson Reagan. So we are, we're the first library to be uh, governed by the Presidential Records Act. And basically the Presidential Records Act is the President and Vice President of the United States, all materials created during their administration belongs to the people, belongs to, it's not their personal property anymore. So when they leave office, their materials are, you know, assumed by the National Archives. Presidents still have lots of, they still have executive privilege, they still have, you know, say on what can and can't can be open. But the physical ownership of these materials changed. And from Reagan forward, all the, all the other presidential libraries fall under the, the presidential records. Act. And what the, around the same time, was also the creation of the Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, as we call it. And so FOIA and the Presidential Records Act kind of go hand in hand. So that's really the bulk of what we do at the Reagan Library and the Archives. We, we respond to Freedom of Information Act requests. And that's anybody can make a request for any materials that we have that are not open. Um, and we will review and and make them available. Now there there are um, several restrictions 
in the Freedom of Information Act, which is what we do during the, the review process. Some of them are very obvious, anything, obviously anything that would affect national security or would be classified, obviously can, can't be open to the public. Um, anything that involves um, uh, business or trade secrets, you know, um, if we came across the, the formula to Coke, the cola, you know, we wouldn't be able to, you know, obviously that's a, that's a strict, we wouldn't be able to open that. And there's a, actually all in all, there are, there are six, what we call six FOIA restrictions. But one of the most, ones that's the most challenging for us is anything that's considered personal, meaning documents created to be open to the public have to be about, you know, the duties of the position that the, the president or any of his staff is in. Anything of a personal nature, you know, can, is anything that would affect somebody's personal life, can, you know, we're, we're not allowed to open. And that sounds a lot more simpler than it is. You know, it, it, it's a very um, subjective. You know, we read through um, materials and, you know, everything, everything gets, before something's closed, especially if it's going to be closed for what we call personal privacy, another archivist has to review. So there, we always have to have two people agree that, yes, this document shouldn't be open for this reason, you know. Um, and if the two don't agree, um, they come to me. <laughs> As Truman says, the, the, the buck stops here. I will make the decision on, on if something can be opened or not. And that's a very, very, very heavy responsibility for us. I mean, that's the decision of what the public can see and the public can't see. And when I, I, we, my entire staff and me especially take that responsibility very, very seriously. You know, and which is why one of the really one of the most important things for us is, you know, I, I, it's funny, you know, when I when I tell people what I do for a living, I, I'm always told, well, you just, you just must love Ronnie Reagan. You, you just must adore him. And I said, well, why do you say that? Well, you, you work in his library. And it's understandable why people will think that. And it's not that I, it's not a love or it's like for Ronald Reagan. I love history, you know, understand. So, you know, and as everyone here today knows, the, you know, the historian's primary responsibility is to be objective and not to have let your personal biases get in the way. So, our anybody's individual political beliefs, I mean, we all have them, you know. But it is it is crucial that those stay in the parking lot when when we come to work every day, all right? Because our responsibility is to tell the story or make available the story of the Reagan administration, the good and the bad, you know. And um, like it's a very very you know we we take this responsibility. Um, very, very simply. It's probably the number one objective, you know. Um, when I'm interviewing new candidates and, and, and they tell me their admiration for Ronald Reagan, I tell them that's great. I'd love to hear that. But when, you, when, we're, when you're working in the archives, your responsibility is, is to the history and not to Ronald Reagan's legacy. You know, that, like I said, it's very, very important. So that's, you know, that, that, that's... Pretty much what we do. <laughs> um, Ira, what you know, you mentioned about when you interview folks and, and people are applying for positions there. Um, what kind of skills would you look for? What what skills are necessary to see these kinds of projects through? You you know, you mentioned objectivity, um, but you know, are what skills are there? And are are these the kind of skills that a student could learn here at BYU or or in, in this academic setting? 
Well, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting. In the archival community, there is, there's always this, there's always been this great debate what makes the, uh, what makes the, what makes the ideal archivist? Is it, is it the person who goes to, to library school and learns all the, 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 the technical aspects of library science? Or is it the, the person who goes uh, more the, the history route and to understand, again, research methods, to understand um, the historiographies, to, you know, to understand the, the story, if you will. And so, you know, I, 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 I run, uh, I have a department of, of 15 people and we are trying to think that we're pretty much divided between those, everybody has an advanced degree. One thing, you know, you, 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 do, you certainly need an advanced degree to, to do this. But I, I have, um, trying to think, I think I have about six, six staff with um, masters in library science and uh, six or seven with masters in history, public history. And, um, and the, the two crazy people on my staff who have both. <laughs> so, um, so, obviously having a, a love for history, you know, people who do, it's, it's, it's interesting to say, you get the, you get the bug in your system. When you start working with, with original documents and primary resource materials, you, you get what we call the bug in your system. You just, you, you get so um, enthralled by it, you know, and, and we all kind of share that, share that same uh, feeling. So, you know, when, what I would say uh, to answer your question is, somebody who's an undergraduate now, who is, is, is working, um, is to try and gather as much, and if you're interested in going into the library museum uh, area, you know, learn your, learn your historical research methodologies, but also try and get some experience while you can. Um, volunteer if you, if you need and, and in your university library or local historical society or local museum, things like that. Understand, you know, I, it's wonderful that I get somebody who is very, very technically knowledgeable, who knows databases and web development and um, encoded archival description and digitization methodologies and things like that. But when I asked them what the salt talks were, they think that's the condiment. <laughs> you know, they, um, <laughs> you know, they don't, you know, so, or the person who, you know, can quote you every Reagan speech or his administration, but you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't understand the technology. It's really trying to, the ideal candidate, if you will, really as much as possible has that, has that balance, that balance of education and technology is really what, you know, is really what you need to, to, to move forward in this. Are there internships available through the presidential libraries? Every library is different. Um, uh, yes, I mean, when actually I was the, uh, when I was at the, the um, Nixon Library, I was, uh, I was actually the internship uh, uh, coordinator there. Um, and um, we do it at Reagan. A lot of the, um, around us in California, a lot of the, the graduate pro programs, um, well, well, actually all the, that I know, all library science and public history graduate programs require some type of um, uh, work experience to finish your degree. So um, you were very close to UCLA and USC and UCLA's library school again has a big requirement. So, and I'm always happy to work with the, the students finishing up their, their, their coursework there to come and get the experience. And um, you know, it, it's free. For me, so that's, you know, <laughs> budgetary. You know. 
<laughs> Free work is always. How would how would you see our BYU students contributing to to these these projects that you're working on and the things that that go on in your library? Well, uh, if anyone's interested, I'm always you know I'm always happy to to review uh, for maybe for a, I suppose interested for a summertime internship. But we would certainly be. Um, happy to help with that uh, and of course I would always I'm always you know after we're done here Arnie please feel free to give my uh, contact information to uh, all of your students if anyone wants to talk more about um, you know careers in, in, in libraries and museums I'm, 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 ha I'm happy to do that but I'd say for now you know again start start building start working on the resume Start working on the resume. Um, you, like I said, you know, you, you, the work experience combined with the education is is what's really key for uh, uh, to, to, to you know to, to be successful. Well, we 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 appreciate that, and I'm sure there are some some questions. Lindsay, have you got some some questions? We can open this up for our questions now. I do, I do, and thank you so much, Ira, for coming and answering some of these questions. I just wanted to say a couple of takeaways that people have been writing me um, is that uh, you've demonstrated in your history the perseverance that you needed to get from one space to another, so that as being a skill that was developed over time, and then the role that other peoples play in this journey is crucial. And so I just thought you would want to know that's some stuff that's coming in in here. Yes. But um, a follow-up question, I'm really glad that you talked a lot about uh, kind of loyalties, right? You know, being objective when you go into the job. And so the question that we had is, if, if there was someone who maybe didn't agree with the presidential legacy of a particular president, would you encourage them maybe not to consider um, getting into that particular presidential library or is that something that you know you can teach tips kind of for ob objectivity like leave kind of your philosophies at the door because you know our goal is to tell the story can you talk maybe a little bit more about some tips or recommendations that you have is that something our students should avoid doing if they don't feel like they can leave their philosophy at the door right it's um You know, yeah, uh, it's it's not always easy. It's not always easy, you know, because we all have our our beliefs, as you said, and we all have our principles, and um, you know, if you are uh, an admirer, personally an admirer, or, or not an admirer of a person, you know, when you come across something, you know, you you like, hmm, you know, <laughs> but. You just have to focus on the objectivity and, and the telling of the, of the whole story is the greater purpose of why we're here. Because if it was ever, and, 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 and please, I'm constantly dealing with, um, uh, from the public, people who don't think that we can be the, you know, objective. Um, on both sides of the aisle. You know, we, um, the people who are not um, Reagan admirers always think, well, you know, you, you think that's, his, that's his library. You can't, you must be hiding things, <laughs> you know, to on the other side of, well, you know, again, you're, you're the government. You must be hiding things, you know. And so, you know, <clears throat> if you if, I, if you had to ask me what's the most frustrating part about my job, well, that that would be it. <laughs> to um, to to try and get across to the public that, you know, it's called the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum. Okay, and there's the library portion and there's a the museum portion. And if you want to go and 
revisit the glory days of the 1980s, the world there I grew up in, so I believe I look back on the 80s fun. Um, then you you know you go through the museum. If you want to study, real study, then you come you you, you come to the library portion. And listen, you know it's uh, the museum gets 500,000 visitors a year, and the library we get a couple thousand. You know, so. um, but if you personally feel you can't leave it at the door, then then you're not. Then it's 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 a disservice to you know. You, you know that's a decision everybody has to make individually. You know, you, you have to understand that the, the greater purpose is to tell the whole entire story. And I find for most people that's enough. I find for most people that's enough. The the the, the Especially people who are, you know, who have the, the the passion for history, that they understand, they understand that, you know. And especially sometimes, you know, when you're studying earlier administrations, there's little things that, you know, I was thinking about. One in particular is is language. Okay, there's terminologies that, especially when I was at Nixon, you'd read across something that would always would be language that would be considered in these days, offensive. But it wasn't so much offensive back then. So your first initial reaction when you come across is, oh my God, you know, this is, I can't believe they, this person said this about that person, you know, but you kind of have to take it into the context of the time that that was, that was a little more acceptable. But that's kind of hard as an individual, you know, to, to, um, to, to, to learn. Um, but I, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. It's that's a really, really a very personal thing, though. You really have to be able to, you know, decide for yourself. You have to be able to decide for yourself. Um, every library actually has a. Um, every library has actually two components. There's the National Archives, who I work for, and then every library has every president has a private foundation. Um, that um, is in the same space that they're we're in, and that their their job is the legacy. Their job is to raise money and and promote the the, the life and time of, of their president. So, you know, um, there's all decisions with them. They don't they don't work so much in the archives, but um, that that is certainly something one one could consider. But it, yeah, it's a very very personal decision. Thank you for expanding on that. I really appreciate it. Um, another question that we had was, how familiar did you need to be with policy creation or lawmaking prior to being hired at Reagan? Is that something that you learned on the job? I know you talked about technical skills being a big plus, but would that be helpful for a student to have some familiarity with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, those, the laws that I talked about, the the Presidential Libraries Act, the Presidential uh, Records Act, the Presidential Recordings and Materials Preservation Act, all those things are, um, and believe me, these are, I, I've summarized them for you, but these are humongous volumes. <laughs> you know? um, um, we'll keep it amongst them here. Um, I actually have read the entire President of our Executive Search and Finish, you know, it's like 10,000 pages. Um, but you know, familiarity with that is is an absolute bonus. Um, you know, one of the probably one of the most meaningful or significant, I guess I should say, projects that I had worked on um, um, when I was first starting out was um, with uh, uh, President uh, Bush was in office. And um, he had nominated John Roberts to the Supreme Court. And John Roberts uh, worked, when he had first started his career, worked in the council's office uh, for the Reagan administration. And so Congress actually requested um, all the materials that John Roberts created, you know, all John Roberts' papers during the Reagan administration. And we had about, I remember we did a search, there was about 50,000 pages worth of materials 
related to John Roberts and her holdings. And um, that would take about six months under normal circumstances to, to review and catalog and preserve and make available to the public. And we had uh, three weeks. <laughs> because the hearings were about to begin to his confirmation hearings were, were about ready to begin. Um, so um, a lot of uh, a lot of late nights getting those materials out. But again, understand again, you know, understanding the nomination process um, uh, for Supreme Court justice definitely was very very helpful. We do, you know, we work. We get calls all the time from Congress. Uh, from the Senate and from the House, uh, wanting give me the documents. <laughs> you know? um, so yeah, the, 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 to answer your question, all that is incredibly helpful. We had another question come in. What kind of government or security clearance is required to work in the presidential archives? Great question. Great question. Um, I don't know if anybody's been to see me Valley, uh, who's been to the, uh, to the library, but they're all kind of, uh, built this, all the, all the prison libraries are, are built similarly. And you have, uh, the museum on top level. And then underneath all of that is, um, what we call the stack areas where all these six, five million pages are, are held. And at the very, very bottom, way deep down, is what we call the vault. And the vault is where materials that are still considered classified are maintained. And only people um, with security clearances can go inside there. And so about um, half of my staff, and myself included, have the necessary clearances uh, to uh, to go into the vault and to uh, actually review uh, these materials. Um, so I, I personally have I have the you know I I have the highest level you can have. Um, it's something that uh, you, it, it, you, nobody has it before you start. Um, it happens once once you get hired. It's a very, very involved process. Um, um, and uh, your life story um, gets, I, I got, I remember when I was getting mine, um, I had gotten phone calls from people in positions I, I had talked to in years. <laughs> we're being, uh, that, that we're being contacted. Um, it's a, uh, um, Yeah, it's an interesting process to get to, to get a secure clearance, but yes, you, you need that. And, you know, it's funny, as years go by, the, the materials that are classified get fewer and fewer. You know, our, our job is to, where we can, declassify as much as we can for the public. But there's some materials that just will not be, you know. You, the Truman Library still has a vault, you know. So, you know, people say, well, that's, you know, the... The nuclear technology, even from the 1940s, they're like, well, that's, that's old technology. It's like, yeah, it's old technology, but it doesn't mean it doesn't work. So that's why, you know, you can't, that's why it's some, some stuff just unfortunately permanently has to, has to remain that way. But um, again, another major responsibility. Sometimes, you know, I've been in the vault and I've read stuff and I've like, wow, <laughs> you know, that this is heavy. But it's, again, it's part of the part of the procedure, part of the job. Thank you for answering that. Um, I think we have time maybe for two more questions. So I just had one come in that said, "Who is responsible for declassification?" Great question. Great question. The um, the creation the creator of the document is the the one who's responsible for the declassification so let's say let's say classified document comes from the state department the state department is responsible for declassification the, the document comes from the cia cia is responsible for declassification the problem is 
probably one of the most frustrating things that we have to deal with is is the time that it takes. So a request, a FOIA request comes in, we find a document to review them. If they're classified, we have to send them off to um, the creating agency for them to give us permission to be classified or not. And sometimes a document can be from more than one agency. It can be uh, one document can have portions from the State Department, some portions from the Department of Defense, from Justice, from CIA. All of them, they all have to sign off on it. They all have to agree to declassify it or what we call partial, you know, some, sometimes, you know, if you see the little black on a document, you know, some, sometimes they'll say you can open that, but you need to restrict this, that, and the other. And it can take, uh, it's very, very, very time consuming. I will, uh, our backlog, we have two for, we have two um, backlogs for classified and unclassified for our Freedom of Information Act request. Our unclassified backlog is, uh, goes back to 2017. That's the, we're working on a request from 2017. Our classified is um, from 2009, which I'm not proud of. But that just shows you how long it takes um, from start to finish to get things to classify. But you're yes, saying you need patience for this job, it sounds like, too. I'm saying if you want a document to write your master's thesis or don't. <laughs> you know? no, because you're not going to get it done. Unfortunately, you're not going to get it in time to, uh, for that to finish. And, uh, th th again, I wish that one, one of the things that I find frustrating. You know, our job is to serve the public. I, you know, I love to open, we love opening stuff. We love people coming in and, and looking at our materials, you know. So the fact that sometimes it can take years and years and years to get something to classify is, believe me, it's just as frustrating for us as it is for the, the requester. Thank you, Ira. Those are all the questions I had coming in. Okay. Ira, we appreciate you taking the time with us today. Uh, I'm going to put a screenshot up here. I'm going to share my screen and let you see Ira's contact information. He's uh, graciously allowed us to share this so that you can um, contact him. And we have uh, really enjoyed this time with you today, Ira. Thank you so very much. And um, Great. And we'll be in touch. I'm sure you'll hear from the students of, uh, at BYU. Folks, Again, thank I'm... you for being here. Ira, thank you for being here. And uh, this concludes our presentation for today, folks. Thank you for, for coming. Lindsay, everybody. Let's give a... Thank you, everybody. Um, My pleasure. Thank Hope you. Soon.